Welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so excited that you decided to connect today. Right now, grab something to take notes with as we begin today's message. Have you ever felt drained by life? Have you ever felt exhausted? Not just the tired like I lack sleep, that tired where you just don't want to move. Have you ever woken up, heard your alarm clock and got mad at it? Like it's just a clock, it can't do anything, it's not a person. You get offended at that alarm clock going off. Have you ever just felt done with life? That feeling of wanting to quit. A few years ago, at the ripe old age of 24, I felt this exact way. Midlife crisis, haven't even hit 30. That feeling of just being done. I was sitting at my kitchen table, just feeling absolutely nothing. It's not like I wanted something to change or I wanted something to stay the same. I just felt nothing. It's not like in this moment I was happy or I was sad. I just felt nothing. I didn't feel like I wanted to go somewhere, but I didn't want to stay where I was at. This feeling of nothing. I wasn't sick of life and I wasn't excited for life. I just felt meh. Have you ever just felt meh? And even more, I want to ask you, have you ever felt like you lacked rest? In this time of my life, I was sleeping in more than ever. I was taking more naps than ever. I was eating more than ever. And yet, even though I had the most sleep, I felt the least rested I ever had. Going from sleeping seven hours and being excited for the day to 10 hours and wanting to sleep more. I learned very quickly in this time of my life that sleep and rest are not the same thing. Sleep and rest are not the same thing. I understand that sleep is good for your physical body. But I believe that rest goes beyond our bodies and it goes into our souls. That rest is not just a state of our bodies, but it's also a state of our minds. It is a state of our spirit. And our key scripture for today as we conclude this series called Shape Up is all about rest. This idea of Shape Up, if you haven't been here this month, is we are talking about how do we as Christians grow in our walk with God. And today I want us to talk about rest In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible says this, For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Everybody say rest Rest. for the people of God. Watch what verse 10 says. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works just as God did from his Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that nobody will perish by following the example of disobedience. Let's go ahead and pray today. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you that rest is found in you. Lord, I pray if there's anybody in this room today or viewing online who is exhausted, who is looking for answers, who is looking for a sense of hope. I thank you, Lord, that today would be the day that their lives were forever changed. I thank you for these things by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as we talk about rest, we understand naturally that rest is something that is very important. And we can use this example, this analogy of our physical bodies to understand the importance of rest. We understand naturally that if you have a perfect diet and you have a perfect workout routine, but you never sleep, guess what? You're not going to grow. If you eat the right things and you do the right workouts, but you never sleep, your body is never going to grow. 
we understand that rest is a part of the recovery process. And I believe today that just as God has provided rest for our physical bodies through what we call sleep, I believe that God has provided rest for our souls. And as we talk about our health, I want us to understand today that rest plays a vital part in our spiritual health, in this spiritual journey. And as we look into the Bible and the book of Hebrews, I believe it gives us a very clear indication of how we are to find rest. And even when we read this Bible verse for today, by itself, it can seem a little bit confusing. So it starts in verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. Now, newsflash, this is not about Pastor Josh. This is about another Joshua in the Bible. And what happened with Joshua was he led God's people into a promised land. And this promised land was to be a place of rest. But even though the people of God were led into this place of rest, the author of Hebrews is saying that there is a rest that exists that Joshua couldn't give. There is a rest that exists that does not just happen in a promised land. And what he's saying here is that there is a rest that exists beyond this land. Verse 9, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So he's saying, although Joshua didn't lead them to this rest, that for God's people, this rest still exists. Verse 10, for anyone who enters into God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. And then verse 11, he encourages them, do everything you can to enter this rest. So as Christians, how do we enter the rest of God? Do we only rest on Saturday and Sunday when we don't have work? Do we rest only when we sleep at night? Do we only rest when people at our job aren't getting on our last nerve because they knew that we woke up late and we had to skip breakfast and we've been living the last two weeks on a diet of apple slices and Starbucks? Is that the only time we rest? In order to understand this rest that God gives to us, we first have to understand Hebrews chapter 3 and the early part of chapter 4. So what happens in Hebrews chapter 3 is it starts with an instruction to fix your eyes on Jesus Christ. The start of this passage is to fix our thoughts and our focus on Jesus Christ. And then what the author does is he contrasts this idea. So on one side, we have the idea of fixing our thoughts on Jesus Christ. And then he compares it on the other side to those who have what's called unbelief. Or for those who don't place their faith in their trust in God. And what the author of Hebrews is saying is that there is rest for God's people. But that the rest that we enter into is not through unbelief. But rest is through placing our thoughts and our focus on Jesus Christ. In other words, to place your faith and your trust in Jesus is to rest. To place your confidence in Jesus is by definition to rest. And then what he says here is on the opposite side, to not believe God or to essentially try by your works is to deny the rest that God already has for you. So we see here that rest is not a question in the Bible of how often are you sleeping. Rest is about who are you placing your trust in. It's not about what can I do by my works to enter into this rest. It's saying, am I placing my trust in the only source of rest that there is? And we see this in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 18. And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest? if not to those who disobeyed. And that's the idea of unbelief. So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. So what was the thing that kept them from God's rest? Unbelief. And you might say, oh, because they didn't trust God, he removed his rest from them. No. He's saying that rest is available but the only way you're truly going to find rest for your souls is in me. So for those that try to get to this rest by their own works, you're never going to find the God type of rest. Because you're depending on your own ability. 
But he says on the flip side, but those who place their faith and their trust in God, that those are the one who enter into their rest. The rest is found in me. So what God is saying here is there's this problem where we need rest. And he's saying, I am the solution. The solution is found in me. So for those who don't enter into that rest, it's not God's punishment. It's just a byproduct of not trusting him. Imagine going to a surgeon and you've got a problem with your knee and you limp around. And the surgeon says, oh, this is a simple surgery. I'm going to go in. It's going to take 20 minutes. I'm going to reattach this and your knee's going to be better. And you leave the doctor in a sense of unbelief. And you say, I'm not going to that surgeon. And you're just limping around. Is that surgeon punishing you for not taking his advice? He's not punishing you. But the byproduct of not listening to your solution is that you're going to struggle with the same problem. So what God is saying here is for those that place their faith and their trust in me, there remains this rest. And he's not punishing you for not trusting in him. But he's saying the thing that you're looking for, that you're searching everywhere for, you can only find in one place. And today if you're feeling weary, I want to suggest go to the right surgeon. If your soul feels tired, go to the right surgeon. And on this, this idea in chapter 4, we see that verse 3 lays out this idea that there are those who place their trust and their confidence in God and they have rest. And there are those who have unbelief that don't enter the rest. And then in verse chapter 4, it says, therefore, so based on this idea of resting in God by faith, Verse not resting by our works. He says, therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. So he's saying, because this idea of entering God's rest is still right in front of you today, be careful that you don't go a different direction. Verse 2, for we have, we have, we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. So he's saying this message of resting in God, the same way that it existed in the time of Joshua, it exists in front of us today. And guess what? The same way that the author of Hebrews says that rest exists for you today, family, church, there is a rest that exists for you today. And what I love in, in this second verse is that the only difference was not how you looked at God. The difference was that they didn't share in the faith of those who obeyed. It comes back to placing our faith in God. He said, everybody heard the same message, but it only benefited those who had the faith and confidence in God. He's encouraging the people. He's saying, place your faith in God, not because it's easy, but because it is what is best. And maybe you're at a moment in your life where the idea of trusting in God is very difficult. We just sang about trusting in God who will never fail. We sang about just let the way make her through because he's going to move. And I love those songs until it's my turn to apply them. And then it's really difficult to let the way make her through and want to do it in your own strength. But what I love about scripture and what I love about God is even though there are moments where we might try to do it in our own strength and moments when we have trouble trusting in God is that God is always right there with us. That in those moments where we might stray and stray and stray, we say, God, why have you left me? And God's like, I'm the one that's keeping you from dying right now. I'm the very thing that's keeping you going in these moments. He says in Hebrews chapter 4, the author, but for those of you who hear my letter, you still have the good news that you can rest in Jesus. That you can rest in in Jesus family church we can rest in Jesus there is rest for our souls in Jesus and then we get to verse 8 our main passage for today 
For if Joshua had given them rest, which he didn't, God would not have spoken of a later day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. And then the encouragement, verse 11, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following the example of disobedience. You see, the key to rest is placing our trust and our confidence in Jesus. The key to rest is placing our confidence and trust in Jesus. And what's difficult about this type of rest is that it has nothing to do with our works. It has nothing to do with our own ability. Essentially, to rest means to let go of control. To rest is to let go of control, to let go of our own works. And many times we try to enter into rest by our works. That if I can just make it to retirement, then I'll finally have rest. If my kids would just stop driving me crazy, then I would have rest. If my job would stop getting on my nerves, then I would have rest. And we look at rest in terms of the world changing around us. When God is saying, you don't need to look to the outside world for rest. Just look to me. You don't have to look at all the things that are wrong in your life and say, if these things were fixed, then I would have rest. No. Rest is found in me. Whatever situation you might have in your life today, whether you're out in the room or you're viewing online, fill in the blank. I don't have rest because blank. I want you to know that's not the reason. That rest, no matter what situation you're going through, is found in the God who will never leave you nor forsake you. You see, rest is not a place that we arrive at. It's a person we connect to. Rest is not a place that we arrive at. It is a person that we connect to. Rest is found in the person, Jesus Christ. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, then Jesus said to me, then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. And I will give you rest. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. Because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus is speaking to a massive audience that is beaten up and broken down and looking for rest. And he says, come to me, and I will give you rest. Like we said, rest is found in a person. It's not found in a place that we can arrive at. And today as we talk about finding this rest of God and entering into this rest of God and this series called Shape Up about taking actions to grow in our spiritual journey, I want us to look at the example of Jesus Christ and say, how did Jesus as he was on earth model this rest for us? What's beautiful about Jesus being fully God and fully man is that as God, Jesus says, here's what to do. And as a man, he says, follow my example. He's not, he doesn't just talk the talk, he also walks the walk. And I want to look at the three Ps, one, two, three, of how Jesus models rest for us. And the first P today is prayer. Jesus models rest for us through prayer. Luke chapter 5, verse 15 through 16 says this. But despite Jesus' instructions, the report of his power spread even faster, and vast crowds came to hear him preach and be healed of their diseases. So essentially, the ministry of Jesus is taking off. That word is getting out that there's this miracle worker. Possibly the Messiah is walking among us, the one that we've been waiting for, and everyone's hearing of it. So people begin to flock to him. But then Luke puts in this detail in verse 16. 
But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. It's like saying Jesus did all of these visible things and all these miracles and the crowds were increasing. But what you didn't know is that he often went to pray. That what you see Jesus doing on the platform was as a result of his prayer life. That the impact that Jesus had was not just because he was out preaching. It's because of also what he did behind the scenes. As things ramped up for Jesus, Luke thought it was important for us to know that Jesus often went and prayed. And as a family today, I want us to be encouraged that the more and more that we're there for others and the more that we're pouring out for others and helping others, don't neglect to withdraw sometimes and find a time to be refreshed yourself. Don't forget to find the time to rest. Don't forget that there is rest in withdrawing sometimes. It's not just about the amount of work that we can do. Sometimes we simply need to rest. Many times in our society, we look at working hard and neglecting rest as a badge of honor. It's like I'm on my grind set. It's not a mindset anymore. It's a grind set. Get, ask me how many hours I slept this week. Go ahead, someone ask me. Two hours. Just on my grind set. No sleep. Eating apple slices and oats. That's it. Like, sir, you need a nap. That's not healthy. We were not designed to run, run ourselves into the ground. Rest is important. Just as we see that Jesus withdrew to pray, I want to encourage you, if you feel like you are lacking in rest, take some time to withdraw yourself and hear God's voice. Take some time to talk to God and take some time to rest. We see with Jesus, not only did he rest in prayer, but number two, presence. There is rest that is found in God's presence. Many times we look for rest in all the wrong places. Like the book of Hebrews is saying, we think we can work our way into a state of rest. And there's a man named Moses in the Bible, and God is telling him to lead an entire nation. Now, if there is one job that I would never want, it's leading an entire nation on behalf of God. Like that is no small ask. And Moses is talking to God, and it's like he's almost arguing with God about this idea that he has of leading God's people. He's in God's presence, and he's stressed out because he does not know who is going to guide him on this journey. Exodus chapter 33, verse 12. And Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me to bring up these people or to lead these people, but God... You have not even told me who you're going to send with me. God, you haven't even explained to me who's going to help me on this journey. In verse 14, and God says back to Moses, my presence will go with you. And I will give you rest. And then Jesus is talking to a tired crowd. And he says, come to me, come into my presence, and I will give you rest. See, whether we look to the beginning of the Bible or to the end of the Bible, God's presence is not just a place that we arrive at. It is a person that we go to, and that person is Jesus Christ. He says, I will give you rest. If we're looking for rest in the wrong places as believers, and I'm very, very guilty of this, speaking from experience, not from theory, there is nothing that we can do to escape God's presence. There is nothing that we can do to get away from God. So we don't need to wonder, is God's presence with me? All we need to wonder is, am I placing my confidence in him? Am I receiving the rest that he's already given to me? As we were talking about this series and working on this sermon, 
Pastor Mike gave me a quote from a man named Dan Ryland. And he said this thing that I loved when Pastor Mike was explaining it to me. He said that a lot of times we are burned out not because we are sleeping, not sleeping or working too hard, but we're burned out because of a lack of joy. That we feel broken down and tired because we lack joy in our lives. Many times we mistake a lack of rest for a lack of joy. And as we're talking about being in God's presence, Psalm 1611 says, You have made known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I was at a talk with Pastor Mike again, and we were talking about joy. And we talked about how joy is often an indication that we're moving from where we are to where we should be. That we're moving from where we are towards towards a goal. So if you want to bench press 135 pounds and you start at 95 pounds and then you make it to 105 pounds, you're going to feel joy because you made progress. 115, joy, I'm getting closer. 125, joy. 135, we made it. When you get towards where you're supposed to be, there is joy. And in Psalm chapter 16, the fullness of joy, or exactly where we're supposed to be, is where? God's presence. It is in his presence that there is fullness of joy. If you are drained and you need rest, I want to encourage you, in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. God has made himself fully available to us. And just like the author of Hebrews said, don't let your unbelief keep you from the rest that God has for you. And if I end the sermon here, here's what we need to rest. It just has to be me, my prayer, and God's presence. But God did not design us to only have a relationship with him. He also designed us to have a relationship with each other. He designed us to be connected with each other. So believe it or not, Jesus did not just find rest in prayer and in God's presence, but he also found rest in being connected with God's people. That Jesus himself was connected with God's people. Mark chapter 3, verse 13. It says, afterward that Jesus went up on a mountain and he called out the ones that he wanted to go with him. There were certain people that Jesus desired to surround himself with. And we know them as the disciples. And they came to him, and then he appointed 12 of them, and he called them his apostles. They were to accompany him, and he would send them out to preach, giving them the authority to cast out demons. So Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God in flesh, at the beginning of his ministry sees that it's important to surround himself with the right people. Now let's be for real. A lot of us carry a lot of weight, but none of us carry the weight of the universe on our shoulders. And if Jesus thought it was important to surround himself with the right people, I want to encourage you to get connected with the right people today. And maybe you're here and you're wondering, how do I get connected to the right people? Where is there an opportunity to be connected with the people of God? If you're saying today, I have no friends, I have no Christian community to be connected with. You come to church and we're sitting in rows, but you feel like you want an opportunity to sit in a circle. I want to show you a quick video of how we as Christians, as believers here today, have an opportunity to be connected with God's people. Let's check out that video real quick. Please state your name for the camera. You want to go first? You're supposed to go first. I'll go first. (laughs) And that's exactly how the video is going to (laughs) start. Hello, my name is Melinda Harrell. My name is Jason Madison. Diana Presti. Hello, my name is Antonio Ramos. Hello, I am Diana Ramos. Vincent Doc Smith. Spencer Cochran. What do you do for a living? 
I am a real estate agent. I am a psychotherapist. I'm a waiter. I'm a healthcare professional and a business owner. I am a carpenter for the New York City Transit Authority. And I am a nurse educator for a health insurance company in New York City. Mainly um, painting, but I do sing and write. So tell us a fun fact about yourself. I'm actually a triplet. There's two girls and one boy. I love the outdoors, I love hunting and cooking. I love spending time on the beach and I can actually stay there for hours and hours. I am a goofball, I love to laugh. Well, I have a son who said he would never be like me. That's talking about being a pastor. And the funny thing is just to see him preaching, teaching, and enjoying being a teacher of the word of God. That's one of the fun facts for me. What made you sign up for Wednesday Night Bible Study? Uh, my walk in faith is fairly new. Um, about a year ago, I started looking into churches, and um, shortly after I joined Family Church here in Middletown, I learned of Bible study um, starting at the beginning of this year. So uh, with my new walk of faith, I wanted to learn about the Bible in a way that was meaningful for me going forward. Because I wanted to learn more about Jesus and I wanted to meet some people too. What made me sign up for Bible study was because although I have been a Christian for some time now, I still feel like I was struggling in one of the biggest areas of my spiritual journey. How has Bible study impacted your life? Um, Bible study has given me an opportunity to get to know different people in the church. Uh, there is a core community of people who get really involved and uh, getting to come on Wednesdays. I see a different group. I get to know more believers. And to be honest, there are some believers who are new to the faith and are learning themselves. And they, I think, are the most, they ask the best questions. They bring out, I think, the best in me and even teach me a lot of things. It was just the right thing to do, you know, where you go in and you're learning the word, you're not wasting your time, you're getting something in return, and you're leaving, like I said, you're leaving spiritually fed. For me, Bible study has impacted my life um, in the way that I just view God in general. I didn't realize how much it helps with everyday life and everyday living, but I'm learning a lot from what we've been able to go over in the class. Every Wednesday when I come, I see there's a teacher, Pastor Mike, Pastor Josh, teaching, then when we meet in that small group, the very things that are taught, you see dispensing and getting rid of the old ideas and the wrong ideas. I either see the believers, their face come alive, and to me, that's just so exciting. Very exciting. How has Bible study caused you to grow? Bible study has caused me to grow because prior to Bible study, when opening the Bible, it was intimidating to me. I was struggling to fully understand because I was lacking the foundations that were required. Now with Bible study, I have a better foundation, so I'm less intimidated, I'm more confident, but I feel more secure when I go to read it. Bible study has um, given me uh, a wonderful opportunity to know God in a different way. And the way I was raised in the church, you know, you're raised a certain way to believe a certain thing, but when you come into a Bible study and you study the Word of God and you see through scripture how God intended it to be applied to our lives, it just helped, it helped me immensely. Bible study has helped me to see God clearer, to understand him differently, and to just feel as if I have a closer connection to him. Uh, for me, Bible study has caused me to grow in many ways, uh, but the biggest way is just being more empathetic and looking at relationships with the people I come in contact with differently. Um, and one of the biggest things is uh, just giving grace in every opportunity I can. For me, um, gaining other people's perspective helped me also learn new things and not seeing things one-sided. I would say spiritually, my walk and my, my excitement and my digging into the Word some more has been very, very different. How has Bible study impacted you emotionally? It's actually helped me to become more stabilized. Like, just knowing that God loves me no matter what, it, it's kind of helped me to not be on highs and lows, even in terms of my relationship with him or how I'm serving, how I'm worshiping. I feel a lot more confident. Bible study has impacted me emotionally in a few different ways. Um, uh, just mainly my, my relationship with God um, and um, conversations with him are more frequent, um, 
in the past, when I would have those conversations, I'd find myself embarrassed for some reason. So uh, that's going away, and the comfort in those conversations has just become better. This morning was one of those moments where emotionally, I was on my knees crying, not so much asking, but thanking him for that moment that he was willing to wake me up and say, take this time for me. Sorry. The emotional impact this had on me was uh, during the Bible studies, actually um, connecting with other believers. So kind of reestablishing that community. Um, I think emotionally, because we are created to be, you know, in community. So I think that was just a reinforcement for me. And emotionally, like now I know I, I actually crave it. Like I want to be around community. Amen, you know? amen. Bible study has helped me emotionally because it's made me realize that um, I'm truly loved by God and he's the only thing that matters to me, but it also made me feel more secure and confident when I'm lacking in my self-worth, that I know that there's a source that can help me feel confident and secure because scripture says everything that is needed to remind me that I am worthy and that I am important and that nothing else matters besides what, how Jesus feels about me. How has Bible study impacted your marriage? I think for us, it became almost like date night. Because Amen. I think, you know, yeah. after you've been married a long time, yeah. you have to be intentional about date right, night. Right. So it was another opportunity for us to spend time together, actually doing something we both love. Right. So relations, I think it, it brought us together, if I could say that. Yeah, now we go got Wednesday night tacos. <laughs> <laughs> What would you say to the person who's listening who is unsure about enrolling in Bible study? Oh, definitely enroll. Definitely enroll. I think don't, don't be afraid. Come to Bible study. Do it. Don't even wait. Just do it. You'll understand more about God. It's literally what you need to get a better relationship with God. The worst that, you, that can happen to you, the very least that can happen, is that you meet somebody that you didn't know. But the best thing that can happen to you is that the Lord just opens up your mind to a different a different level in this walk that we have with him. And if people are to sign up for this, I guarantee it, your spiritual walk, your Christian walk, your family, everything, never the same. Tell us something that makes you happy. You know what makes me happy? When my entire family is at home <laughs> and I'm in the kitchen like a madman and I'm cooking and every dish that I cook comes out perfect. That makes me happy. What makes you happy? Buddy? What makes me happy is going <laughs> shopping and finding a sale. <laughs> He's like, oh, God. <laughs> Cha <-ching. laughs> yeah, See how happy it makes her? <laughs> She's just talking about it. She can't. <laughs> okay. So first of all, Antonio and Diana had me crying the whole time laughing. Like, I couldn't even focus for how funny they were. Shout out Antonio, Diana over here. <laughs> but as we dismiss today's service, I want to encourage you, if you are looking for a Christian community, if you're looking to grow in your walk with God, look no further than Wednesday night Bible study. Our next Bible study is starting Wednesday, March 6th, so not this upcoming Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. And I want to encourage you, try it out once. Take Wednesday, one Wednesday and see if God opens up your mind. If you learn something new, apply something that can change your life forever. And like I was saying in the sermon, we find rest in prayer and presence, but we can never deny the importance of being surrounded by God's people. Out in the lobby, we've got eight tables out there. I want to encourage you, stop by real quick. If you're interested at all, get signed up for Wednesday night Bible study, and then you'll be on an email list to get more information moving forward. Let's go ahead and pray as we dismiss today's sermon.
Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we had to hear your word. Lord, I pray if there's anyone who is looking for a sense of community or a sense of rest, God, I thank you that you provide everything that we need. I thank you, Jesus, that you are the source of our rest. I thank you, Lord, that everybody was blessed as they came in, that we're blessed as we're heading out. And I pray, Lord, that everything we set our hands to this week will prosper and be successful. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so glad we were able to connect together today. If this impacted you in any way, I need you to do a few things for me. I need you to like and subscribe to this channel and head over to FamilyChurchNY.com to take your next steps.